talking about you sort of your political evolution at a young age, that's a good segue to Andy Brimmer's question. I and mean, he wanted to know about Bill Buckley, because I know he was a big influence on you. And he asked, what was he like, and how did you meet him, and why did he have such an impact on your political evolution? Yeah. Uh, I was at uh, the University of Chicago, and I was a columnist for the school paper. I was a humor columnist. And Buckley had written a book called Overdrive, which was about, which was a very pretentious book. Uh, and I wrote a parody of his life as a name-dropping blowhard. And so I said he wrote the th first three volumes of his memoirs on the day of his birth, uh, <laughs> all of human history up to his conception, and then the... And then I, uh, you know, uh, I forgot what else. I, I, he, at Yale, he, he wrote a few books, uh, God and Me at Yale, God and Me at Home, God and Me Go to the Movies. Uh, he formed two magazines at Yale, one called the National Buckley, one called the Buckley Review, which he merged to form the Buckley Buckley. And so uh, I, I wrote this. And so he came to campus <coughs> and he gave a speech and he, he said in the, to the whole student body, uh, David Brooks, if you're in the audience, I want to give you a job. And so really? that was the break I got. Wow. And I, I, sadly, I wasn't in the audience. Uh, <laughs> um, I was actually out in California um, on my first TV appearance. I'm going to ask you about your first TV appearance in a second. But my first was at age 20. Uh, Milton Friedman did a show, Debating the Young, and a P PBS show called Tyranny of the Status Quo. And I was on the left. I was a socialist then. And I would, I would make a point with. I would make a, an argument that I'd read in some textbook. He destroyed it in about six words. And then the camera would linger on my face as I tried to think of what to say. And it was like, it's actually, if you go on YouTube, you can see me doing really? that. Really big glasses. So uh, is that when you made the shift, when Milton Friedman well, had you for lunch? Not, not exactly. He, uh, yeah, it was one meal with a really short <laughs> guy, Jewish guy. Uh, but he opened my, eye, my eyes. I'd never met anybody who thought like him at all. So he opened my eyes. And so I came back, and I worked as a reporter in Chicago, and I covered crime. And I saw what had happened, what I thought was bad welfare policies destroying Chicago. And that switched me over to the right. And um, uh, I called Buckley up three years later, and I said, is the offer still open? He said, yes. And so I was covering rapes one day. 24 hours later, I was at his, uh, his Park Avenue apartment going to dinner. There were finger bowls. I mean, I, I remember thinking, this is watery soup. This is terrible. <laughs> but uh, and I just, uh, and then he became my mentor. And when you were his, when you were, he was your mentor, um, he was, he not only did my, edited my prose and told me how bad it was, took me to Bach concerts, took me yachting. You became really close to him. And then he sent you off. And his greatest capacity was for friendship. Fantastic friend. So one of his biographers calculated he probably wrote more letters than any other human being of the 20th century. He was just writing out torrents of letters. Uh, he had the sort of brain that just could not slow down. He just did not know how to slow down. And so if it wasn't articles or spy novels, it was letters. And so he really became the mentor, and then he sent me off. And so how many years did you work with him? 18 months. 18 months. Yeah. Okay. And, and now I have to ask you. No, well, wait, Phyllis, I'm so boring compared to you. Philosophically, <laughs> philosophically, how did, he, how did he shape you, those, how, those 18 months? Obviously, it sounds like he taught you some important life lessons yeah. about friendship, exposed you culturally to all sorts of things. Right. But, but in terms of your philosophy of life and uh, your political point of view, how did he shape those? Right, well, he, was, uh, he created a tradition of conservatism. Remember, in 1950, there was barely anything called conservatism. And he and, and Friedman and others, uh, a lot of former leftists like John Dos Pesos, uh, Max Eastman, James Burnham, uh, they formed what we think of as conservatism. And so you didn't only go to National Review, you went to a whole, you joined a whole tradition. And it was a tradition stretching back and then had me read Edmund Burke again, had me go back to Augustine. And his brand of conservatism was a Catholic, somewhat libertarian strain. Uh, but you were joining a movement. And you know, you went back to Whitaker Chambers, who was more or less his mentor, who was involved in the famous Hiss Chambers trial. And so you really were joining a whole movement, a deep intellectual movement that was not so much a political movement, it was an intellectual movement. And so I read, I just read all those people. And some of them were still alive uh, when I was there. James Burnham, this great writer from the 30s, who was a Marxist, then became a great writer on the right. He was still there, though. He had suffered a stroke, so he had no long-term memory. And so every time he met you, 
um, he, he met you for the first time, which was sad because Buckley was his closest friend, but every time he met Bill, he met him for the first time, and it was sad to see that. But I really joined a whole tradition going back to Badgett and Russell Kirk, and, and it was part of being a movement, and it was really intellectually forming. And, but it was all off on the side until Buckley came along and created what we think of as, as conservatism, the Republican Party. Really, no Buckley, no Reagan, none of that. At the end of his life, I asked both Friedman and Buckley, I said to each of them, you, you have uh, both had more historical impact than you could possibly have imagined when you started. So do you feel a sense of contentment? Uh, and neither understood the question. They, didn't, they felt none of that, no contentment, like I've had a great life. Well, they might have felt that, but they were just always thinking about the future. There was no sense of satisfaction. What do you think they would think of the, the Tea Party today? Um, they, they would be more friendly to it than I would, both of them. Both because they were both more libertarian and, both, and also because they were way more anti-establishment. Uh, they both loved poking holes. And it, at, at, at the establishment, they liked being rebels. Uh, Friedman, from strictly intellectual grounds, because he had a completely formed worldview, Buckley enjoyed the combat of it. And if you go back to some of the early Buckley's speeches in the 1950s um, and the debates he had, they were brutal. They, they, he and John Kenneth Galbraith and those guys would go at it with a v vigor that was just an insult each other. I mean, the famous Gore Vidal debate, I think at the 1968 convention, which we will not repeat. But um, the politics, as he waged it, was brutal. And he was really going after New York and New York Times I mean, he, he, would not, he, would not, he would be here, but he would go after everybody here. And so they, they, he, they would have more, much more sympathy, maybe, than I do. And, and, and how, so how...